Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing gastric acid secretion. Okay, so we've just discussed the anatomy of the stomach as well as the histology of the stomach wall. Okay, now, um, we have seen the parietal cells that are lining the entrance to the gastric glands. Okay, it is these cells which will secrete gastric acid. Okay, but they only secrete gastric acid in a certain portion of the stomach, which is the body. Okay, so in the body of the stomach, the wall of the body of the stomach will have uh, gastric uh, pits, which will have gastric glands coming off them. And in these gastric glands, you will have parietal cells, and these parietal cells will be secreting uh, gastric acid. Okay, so what we now want to look at is how do they secrete uh, gastric acid? How do they secrete hydrochloric acid? Okay, well firstly, let's look at the structure of these parietal cells in a little bit more detail. Um, so, basically parietal cells have a weird structure. So, if we have we're drawing now a zoomed-in picture of what we saw before, okay? So, in turquoise here, this will represent the basement membrane, okay? And now we're going to show the parietal cell nearby some uh, epithelial cells. So, basically, this is the sort of shape of a parietal cell, okay? It has a, this sort of odd shape where it sort of has this narrow sort of exit here, and basically, it'll have uh, epithelial cells, which are sort of shaped to fit around it, basically. So here's another columnar epithelial cell, which will have its nucleus near the base here. Okay, and the nucleus of the parietal cell will be here. Okay, and then you'll have another uh, epithelial cell, which will be a columnar epithelial cell that will be here, maybe, uh, with its uh, nucleus down here. Okay, so... Uh, these are epithelial cells. This is an epithelial cell here. And then this cell in the middle is the parietal cell. Okay, and basically this parietal cell is uh, the one which is going to be secreting the hydrochloric acid. And we want to now look at how this parietal cell is going to uh, secrete the hydrochloric acid. Okay, so it has this weird structure. And I just want to also give you another piece of terminology, which is that this little channel that you've got coming out of the parietal cell like this, this is called a canaliculi. Okay, so what's going to happen, basically, is the parietal cells are going to secrete the hydrochloric acid into the canaliculi, which will go into the gastric gland, which will then go into the gastric pit, and then into the lumen of the stomach. Okay, so we now want to see how do they secrete hydrochloric acid. Okay, well, basically, this all depends on the polarization of these cells. Okay, so they have an apical membrane, which is the membrane that faces onto the canaliculi, and they have a basolateral membrane. And basically, we want the hydrochloric acid to be secreted from the apical membrane, and we want the uh, resources that we will use to uh, produce the hydrochloric acid that we're secreting on, off the apical side to come from the basolateral side. Okay, so this is the basolateral membrane over here. Okay, so what I will now draw is a bigger picture of the basolateral membrane with the apical membrane. So we're going to zoom in here. Okay, so let's say this is the basolateral membrane here, and this is the apical membrane. And let's see how this process is going to occur. So basically, fundamentally, what drives this is that you have a protein in the apical membrane of these parietal cells. Uh, and by the way, I should have also said parietal cells are also called oxyntic cells. You will occasionally hear them referred to as oxyntic cells. So parietal cell or oxyntic cell. Okay, so off the apical membrane of the parietal or oxyntic cell, what you have is a special protein known as the proton potassium ATPase. Okay, often just called the proton pump. So this here, this is the proton potassium ATPase, okay? Although the more common term for this 
is just to call it the proton pump. Okay, and you will hear that used often, especially when we talk about inhibitors of this protein. Okay, right. So what does this protein do? Well, basically, it exchanges protons for potassiums. So basically, it chucks two, pota uh, sorry, two protons out of the cytoplasm of the cell into the canaliculi, okay? And in exchange, it brings two protons back in from the canaliculi into the cytoplasm. And to do that, basically, it requires ATP. So it's an enzyme which breaks down ATP. So it will take ATP in, and it will hydrolyze it to ADP and inorganic phosphate. OK, right. Uh, so it's moving protons from the cytoplasm into the canaliculi, and it's bringing protons back in. So that is a uh, electrical electrically neutral uh, tr movement, basically, because you're moving two positively charged ions out and you're bringing two back in. So there's nothing electrically non-neutral there. Okay, right. Uh, now, what's going to happen is the proton concentration in the cytoplasm is going to go down. Okay, and that will reshift an equilibrium, basically, because in the cytoplasm of the cell, you have water molecules, and you also have carbon dioxide molecules. Now, these can be converted by an enzyme, okay? They can be converted by an enzyme known as carbonic anhydrase into carbonic acid, okay? And then when you produce carbonic acid, what happens? Oh dear, it's not fitting in, never mind, carbonic anhydrase, okay? Uh, so when carbonic acid um, is formed, what will happen is it will break down pretty quickly into bicarbonate ions and protons, okay? So there's always an equilibrium, basically, between this forward reaction and the backward reaction, okay? Now, if you suddenly reduce the number of protons in the cytoplasm, then the rate of the backward reaction will go down. So the equilibrium will start being shifted, basically. Uh, the equilibrium will be distorted as soon as you reduce the rate of the backward reaction, okay? So the equilibrium will be distorted, and uh, the forward reaction will be occurring at a greater rate temporarily, so you'll get more uh, protons and bicarbonate ions being formed. Now let me just talk about this reaction a little bit more. So, remember we saw the structure of carbonic acid. Carbonic acid basically has this structure here. Okay, it's a carbon atom with uh, a double bond to an oxygen, and then these two alcohol groups coming off it. Okay, so what we are doing is we're going to take carbon dioxide and we're going to take water and we're going to combine the two of them together to produce carbonic acid. Okay, and you can imagine how this reaction makes sense because what you can imagine doing is breaking the second of those two bonds between the oxygen and the carbon atom in for one of the bonds in carbon dioxide, okay? And you can imagine giving one electron back to the oxygen and one back to the carbon, okay? Then you can imagine breaking one of the bonds between the oxygen and the hydrogen in water, okay? And you can again imagine giving one electron back to the oxygen and one back to the hydrogen. Then you can imagine binding this oxygen here to this carbon here, because both now have a free electron. This oxygen has a free electron from the breaking of this bond. This carbon has a free electron from the breaking of one of these uh, bonds in this double bond. Okay, so those two combine together, that will produce one alcohol group off this carbon. And then you can imagine binding this hydrogen to this oxygen, which has a free electron because of the breaking of this bond. And the hydrogen also has a free electron because of the breaking of this bond. Okay, and that will produce us this structure here. Now, carbonic acid isn't very stable, so what it will do is it will very quickly dissociate into bicarbonate anions, okay, and free protons. Okay, so the proton leaves one of the oxygens, and then it leaves it with both electrons, so the oxygen gains a negative charge, and that produces bicarbonate. So really, the equilibrium in the cytoplasm is between uh, water and carbon dioxide on one side, and then 
bicarbonate anions and protons on the other. So basically, if you're now reducing the proton concentration in the cytoplasm by pumping them into the canaliculi, okay, what's going to happen is this equilibrium will be distorted to produce you more protons, basically, to try and produce more protons to raise the concentration of protons back up. Now, what does that result in? What results in more than anything else by carbonate concentration going up? Because remember, what initially did we do? We reduced the proton concentration. That drove the reaction in the forward direction, okay, to produce more products. But the bicarbonate wasn't reduced in the first place, so we produced more bicarbonate, basically, because even though the proton concentration in the cytoplasm hasn't gone up, because, of course, it was originally downwards, so even when you up this reaction, it doesn't go back to what it was before you ever put this protein in. But because the bicarbonate concentration wasn't taken down by this protein, it's going to go up, basically, in the cytoplasm. So bicarbonate concentration will go up in the cytoplasm. Proton concentration will go up because you're driving the reaction forward, but it won't get back to what it was before this prote protein here started actually pumping the protons out. Okay? But bicarbonate has gone up. So what are you going to do with this bicarbonate? Well, basically, there is an antiporter in the basolateral membrane over here. Okay, so we'll colour this in in turquoise. And this basically exchanges bicarbonate ions uh, for chloride anions. Okay, so bicarbonate anions will be moved out of the cell in exchange for chloride anions. And that's an electrically neutral switch, basically. Uh, because they both have a single negative charge. Okay, so you've now got chloride anions going up within the cytoplasm. Okay, so let's think through now what needs to happen. So the protons are being produced, they will be continuously pumped out. So we're producing more and more higher and higher proton concentration here. Okay, we're also producing a higher and higher potassium concentration in the cell, and we're producing a higher and higher chloride concentration within the cell. So actually what's going to happen is you have channels in the apical membrane for both potassium and for chloride, okay? And what will happen is the potassium ions will move out of their channel, okay? So out come these two potassium ions, and you'll also get the movement of two chloride anions, and basically you need the movement through these channels to pretty much be matched because you need it to be electrically neutral, basically. So these channels are separate channels. This is a potassium channel that the potassium ions are going out of in pink here. And uh, this is a chloride channel here in blue, which the chloride anions are going out of. Uh, but the movement through both of those channels will be uh, matched so that the movement is overall electrically neutral. Okay, so the potassiums will move, the chlorides will move. Okay, so you have to bring in two chlorides to get rid of those two potassiums. And now the overall effect of this is that we now have two hydrogens on this side and two chlorides. Well, basically, that's hydrochloric acid. If we just bring water now, and of course, because we're moving this solute from one side to the other, water will now follow via osmosis, basically. Okay, so you've now got hydrogen cations and chloride anions dissolved in water, that is hydrochloric acid. Okay, so that is how these parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid. So fundamentally, the most important thing is this proton pump here, this proton potassium ATPase, which pumps two protons out and brings the two potassiums back in. The two potassiums that come back in eventually go back out again. Um, they can't just go back out on their own because that wouldn't be electrically allowed. It needs to always remain electrically neutral. So it has to wait for the two chloride anions to come with it, basically, so that it can remain electrically neutral. Okay, now where does the continuous source of protons come from? Well, it comes from water combining with carbon dioxide to become carbonic acid, uh, which will break down into a proton and bicarbonate, 
So the protons can then be pumped out. The bicarbonate will then be exchanged for chloride anions. Again, another electrically neutral switch. This provides the chlorides which will go out with the potassium ions. Okay, and what are we continuously using up here? Well, fundamentally, the things we're using up are the water and the carbon dioxide. Okay, but of course we produce water and carbon dioxide all the time by respiration, so that's not too much of a problem. Okay, we're also dumping bicarbonate out uh, the basolateral side of the parietal cell. That will just go into the blood basically, and we don't need to worry about that either uh, because the blood is a huge, great volume, so our contribution isn't going to be that dangerous. And bicarbonate's a useful buffer to have in the blood anyway. Okay, and then finally, water just moves via osmosis across uh, the parietal cell into the canaliculi. Okay, so this is how these parietal cells produce uh, hydrochloric acid then. Okay, right. One thing that I want to now talk about is that there are certain drugs which are called uh, proton pump inhibitors which are basically drugs which will bind to the proton potassium ATPase here and stop it from functioning, okay? So they will stop the secretion of hydrochloric acid via these parietal cells because after all, this is the driving force for the secretion of hydrochloric acid. This is where the energy is being used, okay? So drugs which do this, which bind to uh, the proton potassium ATPase and block it from transporting protons into the canaliculi, uh, include omeprazole. Omeprazole was the first proton pump inhibitor to be introduced, and also uh, lanzoprazole. Okay, there are other ones as well, uh, but these are the two most famous ones: omeprazole and lanzoprazole. Okay, so all of the proton pump inhibitors uh, have their names ending with this suffix, prazole. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, we will continue this discussion in the next video where we'll talk about uh, the factors uh, influencing the rate of activity of these parietal cells.